going to start off by giving you some statistics because I think that's a good way to kind of get a grasp of the sociological statistics or the situation in the West. So the truth is, according to BuzzFeed, which is one of the organizations that deals with um, analytics, 99.5% of teenagers under the age of 15, under the age of 15, have, according to this, viewed some kind of pornography in their lives. 99.5%. 30% of those who view pornography in the Western world, including in America and these places, are females. That's 30%, which is a growing number. The average for someone to have intercourse, a relationship for the first time, the average age is a mean age of 17.1 years for a male. And about 18 years for a female in in this country and other countries like here in the West. The point being is you're dealing with a monster. You're dealing with a fire which cannot be extinguished easily. The industry, the pornography industry, the prostitution industry, the escort industry, the pseudo-institutional boyfriend and girlfriend relationships is too big for you to break. And you will not succeed, and we will not succeed, in just telling our children to be patient. Just telling our young ones, just be patient. It's not possible. We've come to that conclusion now. Statistically, it's not possible. It's actually unfair, in my opinion. It's it's a kind of torture you're putting them through. You cannot say be patient as an indefinite thing. You have to say be patient and then put a time period at least in that equation. Be patient until you finish your education. Be patient until... You're 18 years old. Be patient until, and give a reasonable time period. So the advice to generation one is that you need to, we need to now think about our strategy because the old strategy of waiting for this Prince Charming who has the, um, the best job and the biggest uh, wallet, that is not a successful strategy. It's not a successful strategy because that person might never come or he might, he might come after a very long time and all the things have happened to your daughter and or son already. It's too late now. And they've become unmarketable, in fact, corrupted. And they're not interested in marriage because they're getting what they need from elsewhere other than marriage. And you've lost your child, in a sense. Because zina is a gateway to all kinds of fisk and haram. And it's a gateway to leaving the deen, actually, because zina is a very potent and powerful thing. And the emotion of sexual drive is one of the most aggressive emotions in the human um, physiological composition. So I would say to you, be careful. Be careful. Do not expect that which cannot be expected. But at the same time, to generation two, Generation two have to have reasonable demands as well. Can't be some kind of 16-year-old who is still not self-sufficient, and doesn't understand the value of hard work, and you just, you know, you're in a relationship now, a haram relationship, and then you go to your father or your mother or both of them and say, you know, we want to be in a relationship and I want to do a nikah. This is also unreasonable. This is an unreasonable proposition because you haven't shown that you're willing and ready to take the responsibility of marriage. You're not ready yet, possibly. You could, there, is a, there is a situation where you cannot be ready for marriage. You're not able to handle that responsibility. You're just in love 
And love is a very powerful emotion. And that's why the Wali system is in place in Islam. The Wali system is there to protect you, young person, from yourself. Because the Wali can see what you can't see. Your father can sometimes see what you cannot see. Especially if exploitation is, is to do with it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran that the reason for marriage is so you can have a partner لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا And he says, وَجَعْلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً That you're meant to have the relationship of marriage is meant to be one where you're meant to find tranquility in your partner. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who will put between you and your spouse mawadda, love and mercy, and rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed that as a natural thing. Love is not something which we despise in Islam. And we're saying, don't love your partner in these things. No. In fact, Allah has created us as, as creatures that are in need of this emotion and in need of companionship. But it must be done in a safe setting and with the right structures in place. So what I say to the young people is that you have to also understand that you cannot feel as if you can get away with any relationship before marriage. Because you know, the first humiliation will be a dunyawi humiliation. You'll be humiliated in the dunya. You'll be hurt. Love is a very powerful thing. There's a woman called Helen Fisher. She's an anthropologist, a social anthropologist. And she deals with love. She deals with love. She, she actually MRI scanned, you know. She MRI scanned people who are in love to see what kind of data she could collect. She found some really unusual findings that people who are in love had the same part of the brain activated which would be activated when people are addicted to cocaine. And the same releases are made, like the same sec secretions are made. Uh, you know, dopamine, oxytocin and these hormones are secreted from the brain when someone is in love. So that person is an addict. If you have now someone who's a 16 or 17 year old who's in love, I'm sorry, but we cannot trust your judgment as a rational one. That's why we need the welly in place to help and harness your addiction. The welly can sometimes decide that you are too irresponsible for this commitment, but the welly must also realize that if this powerful addiction is left untethered and unharnessed, they can, it can go out of control. If you look in the sociological environment at people who are addicted to cocaine or heroin or these very heavy drugs, it's a difficult rehabilitation process, to say the least. Incredibly difficult. It's not like marijuana, which I'm hearing in this country is going to become legal soon. Why are you smiling? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. You see, it's, it's not like that. It's, a, it's, it's much more difficult. If you're addicted to cocaine or heroin, it's much more difficult to disconnect from that. And according to the research of Helen Fisher, when you're in love, it's that same uh, part of the brain which deals with addiction. The it's called the reptilian core. The reptilian core of the brain. It's like a central part of the brain. Which, which is activated when you're in love. So here, we must have a strategy in place. A strong strategy in place to deal with this. I would say the first thing people need to know is rationality is important before you get married for the young people. You need to have your rational faculties in place. 
And you need to be careful with this emotion of love. Because if you're struck with love, if you're love struck, you have become unable to make decisions rationally. Your emotion will invariably take over your thought process and your cognitive faculties. You will no longer be able to make an informed decision. And actually spiritually, Islamically, it can lead to a kind of shirk actually, an association with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in my opinion. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَا يَتَّخَذْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That there are certain people that take aside God and dad. And dad is like a nid, is, is a false god. That they love, lo love them like they should love Allah. But those who believe are more strong in believing in Allah than those individuals. What does this mean? One of the conditions of ibadah is that you should have ultimate love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have ultimate obedience, ultimate fear, and ultimate love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you should not love anyone more than you love Allah and then his messenger after that. But some people, because it's the, the environment is so open now, they get into these, I would call them addictive relationships, and this emotion, the emotion of love, becomes a feature of that relationship, and then they start doing exactly what their partner tells them to do, even if it's completely against Islam. And that's how zina happens, by the way. It's one of the main ways zina, fornication, and sexual intercourse outside of marriage happens. Especially, this is how, and th there are some statistics to back this, this is how many women agree to zina. They agree to, the, to it, not in a vacuum. A woman is not going to be told. I mean, they've done many research on this. A man is different to a woman, by the way, yani, physiologically. So if a woman goes to a man, if, if a woman, a very good-looking woman, goes to 10 men or 100 men, and she says, would you like to have, sorry, but there's lots of kids here. I mean, but, you know, we have to say this, uh, yani, so just to get the point across. Would you like to have intercourse tonight? And this has been done. There have been studies that, you know, social experiments and actual studies that, and the man could say, like, you know, 70 or 80% of uh, recipients could, uh, or uh, candidates could say, yes, I would uh, go ahead, no problem. Just like that. But a woman is not that easy. A woman is statistically, yani, she's not that easy. She's... She's not going to do that. Even if she's a big, the biggest atheist, she does not believe in God. Don't think that, you know, just because she's an, this is a misconception. Some people, they come from the West. I've seen it, stuff for Allah, but I've seen some people, they come from the Khalid region, yeah? And then they come to London and they think all women are prostitutes. And, <laughs> you know, they think every woman is a prostitute. It's not like that. The woman is not going to agree to give herself her body, you know, in a vacuum like that. So it usually happens in the context of love. So a woman, she'll start to develop a kind of attachment to a man. And then, in that context, since now she's attached, he can tell her what to do. Whether a man is telling a woman what to do, and a, or a woman is telling a man what to do, in a relationship which is either premarital, extramarital, or marital, and that thing is against the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that know that you're on thin ice. Because you could be going into that, Shirk category, where you're now taking the love of the other person as higher and beyond the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what you have to think about. Because why are you obeying someone based on the love you have for them and disobeying the Creator as a result of this? Like the hadith says, There is no obedience in the to the creation in the disobedience of the Creator. But people fall into that obedience because they have this emotion taking over them. We need to have seminars and we need to have awareness. We need to raise awareness on this very powerful addiction or these powerful addictions. The addiction of love. Because this addiction could lead people to more corrosive and problematic and corruptive elements or directions and channels than sometimes Addictions to drugs can lead them to. It can lead them to those directions. So we need to be very, very careful.
careful with these things. Because Allah allows love to exist in a marital relationship. So it's not a bad thing. But people need to know how to deal with that emotion. Just like they need to know how to deal with their sexual desires. But we have to be realistic. And this is what I'm trying to say to you. Because we are human beings that are prone to those things. Are prone to love. Are pl prone to desire. And relationship. Therefore it must be balanced. And that's why subhanAllah the institution of marriage. Is the harness. That harnesses all of these emotions. You know Freud. Sigmund Freud. You know the... Uh, psychologist of the 1900s, the early 1900s. He, he struck a really interesting parable which was very similar to a hadith I read as well. He said that you have to control your emotion as if you are riding a horse. Yani, you are the horse rider and the horse represents your desires. And he says that, you, and he, he called it the id ego and the super ego and he had this whole theory of it. But the idea is you have to be in control of the direction you're going in. Your aql has to control your hawa. Your intellect has to control your desires. And interesting because the word aql itself comes from aqal. Or comes from this word which means to tie a horse up, interestingly. You know. To tie a horse up from the head and to control the horse going left and right. This is what the aql is. The aql is when you use your emotions... When you use your aql, your intellect to control your emotions. Which is why subhanAllah, you know the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad uh, Sa'id al-Khudri. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Where, and this is a very popular hadith that is, I think, misused a lot of the time. But it's interesting here. Where the Prophet says about women that they're naqisatu uh, aql wa deen. Wait a minute. A lot of people say this is a sexist hadith. What's going on here? You know, a lot of atheists and these, they say sexist hadith. But it's a very powerful hadith. And people are not looking into it properly. Because it doesn't say the hadith, doesn't say that naqisatu ilm wa deen. Have you thought about this? The, the, the hadith doesn't say that they are naqisatu ilm wa deen. When it's talking about women, the Prophet said that they have a deficiency in aql and deen. Now, what does this hadith mean? Why didn't he use the word ilm? Because aql is the ability to use your intelligence or your rational faculties to control your bestial desires. And what the Prophet is saying is comparative to men, women can sometimes have a lesser ability to use their rational faculties in order to direct their, whatever it is, their direction of travel. It's not saying that they're less intelligent in the, in the ilmi sense, in the sense that they have less knowledge. It's not the case. He's just saying that women can sometimes act more emotionally than men. That's all that he's saying. Which is why it makes sense for a woman to have a welly and a man does not have a welly for marriage. It, it all adds up, yani, if you think about it. David Stove, he wrote an interesting piece on this. He said that it's not a controversy. Yani. He, wrote, he wrote in his book, he said it's not controversy. And this guy's an atheist, he's not a Muslim. He said, it's not, an it's not a controversy at all to say that rationality is obscured for women in certain cases. Even Simone de Beauvoir, the, uh, the writer of Second Sex, she is a feminist, the one of the heaviest feminists. She says in her second chapter of her book, Biology, she calls the chapters Biology, she says there's no controversy. She says herself, women are more emotional than men. No one disagrees with the fact that women are more emotional than men. Which means now there needs to be a special protection and that's why Allah and the Messenger have allowed now for this welly system to, uh, to, uh, to, to be in place for a woman especially. Because exploitation can happen. And if you look at Helen Fisher's uh, studies, you'll see that women have a higher um, <clears throat> propensity to fall in love than men because of the maternal instinct and these things. They do. They, and, and you know what? This is something which is written about by someone called um, Warrell Farron. He talks about the fact that women are much more, for instance, they love romance. It's not a stereotype. It's not a social construct. 
If you look at the sociological environment, you'll see that women are much more into, like Annie, love novels. 90% or 95% of all love novels are, written, uh, are read by women. They love uh, ro romantic things and these things. Well, it's not, a, it's not a social construct. The, da the data shows us that women are into these things. So what that shows from that sociological perspective is that women are possibly can be deceived by some men, especially at a younger age, which is why the welly needs to take an active role, especially with women. And this sounds anti-feministic, but we don't care because Islam in some cases is anti-feministic. But we have the data and the, the evidence to show why and how that is the case. And how feminism sometimes fails and sometimes it doesn't give us the solutions to the problems of the world. But you see, here's the point I'm making. The point is, there are systems in place in Islam which are very much deliberate and to the advantage of all the parties that are involved. Do not mess around with these systems. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he gave us a very important, potent advice. He said, Ya Ma'ashar al-Shabab. He said, oh, young people. He said, whoever can of you. To get married, get married. If you can't, then fast. This is what he said. This is the advice of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't say just wait and be patient and finish your education, get a house and these things. No. The Prophet himself, look at how many, how many times he got married. Look at the Sahaba, how they would get married and what ages they would get married at. Let's be real about this. They would get married at a young age and they would get married very frequently. Very frequently. They wouldn't wait around to commit zina and to put themselves in that situation. This is not the way of the Prophet and, and, and the, uh, obviously the Sahaba. They would, when they found the opportunity, okay, they would take the opportunity. So we need to make it easier for people to get married here in this country and in the West, generally speaking. I'm not saying now this means all the young people, you know, demand from your fathers, you know, and your, and your families that, you know, you get married in these things. You might not be ready. You might, the father might have a genuine reason why he's stopping a marriage from taking place. He sees that you're completely overtaken by love and these things and you need to calm down, for instance. But at the same time, there might be a situation where the father now needs to look at the lesser of two evils. He needs to look at this and this. And you, may, you, be, you might you have your wilaya stripped of you sometimes. You'd be surprised. Because a sheikh could come into the picture, an uh, imam, and then the, the, the two people go to a sheikh and they say, look, you know, we want to get married, and the father is stopping it, and then they do it whether you like it or not. Because the, the imam allows it for, to happen. And they say this person, the wilaya is stripped because they're stopping the marriage. And this can happen very easily. So it's better for you to contain to maintain it in your control, yani, in my opinion. Because no one in Islam has as much a, a power to stop all of these things from happening. You know. 